meeting of the National Security and Defense Council, uh, where there were a very strong and, uh, from my point of view, fruitful discussion. In result, of these discussions, the um, meeting, uh, the National Security and Defense Council decided to Oh, a few very important um, decisions, made very, a few very important decisions. First of all, we are still trying to be a part of Minsk negotiation process. It's mm -hmm. extremely important for us because we still want to, uh, to solve this situation is now peaceful uh, uh, way we try to negotiate. The so which part of the Minsk uh, yeah. agreement the, is the most important yeah, are you yeah. focusing on? The second, we strongly understand, but we can speak only if we have enough forces, if we have the position which is strong enough for negotiation. If we who are weak, uh, nobody will speak with us. With whom you are, are you negotiating in that way, if you talk on a daily basis? Do you, or what negotiation do you mean, if we try to negotiate? I mean, there were negotiations somewhere in Milan, but it was a while ago. You see there is some uh, contacts on this issue, and I am... Uh, I hope that we will uh, another rounds of this negotiation in the future. Uh, but uh, I think the most important what we have just now, right now, is uh, that we are trying to reinforce our position on the east. We are trying to build fortification lines in these places. We are trying uh, to help our soldiers, our um, heroes, uh, to defend our country. Uh, you see, this uh, very this uh, meeting made very important, from my point of view, decision that uh, Ukraine will not pay uh, for any uh, social and other fine, uh, we will not uh, pay for any uh, situation in this uh, region, in uncontrolled uh, region, because we think that after the so-called elections, these uh, guys took all the responsibility in, for the situation in these places. But before the election, Ukraine was prepared to pay for it? Because that's a key part of the Minsk protocol, yeah, that yeah, Ukraine yeah, would pay course, for infrastructure. Of course, of course. Uh, but uh, this election was a brutal... Uh, uh, these uh, people uh, didn't do a gay, didn't uh, do according the Minsk, uh, Minsk process, Minsk agreement, and this uh, this uh, election was maybe the most. Uh, brutal thing, mm. uh, officially, of course. Well, no, it's they uh, kill people. It's much more different. I mean, it's hard because when we talk about, you know, in English we talk about a roadmap for yeah, peace, yeah. like something that you follow, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like a path in the ground. And it's difficult because every time someone steps off of that path, yeah, yeah. it makes it hard to continue. And there had been smaller steps. I mean, the ceasefire is something people have focused on, that there's been fighting the whole time. Yeah, yeah. But for the Ukrainians, it seems that, you know, this... Um, the vote in the East was been a step off of it completely. It's the biggest uh, step off. You see, uh, ceasefire, uh, they broke ceasefire many, many times. Mm -hmm. Maybe more than uh, 1,000. We, we detected more than 1,000 events of shelling our position, etc., etc. But Ukraine has also shelled. I mean, it's of not course, a one sided we issue. Uh, our forces masterfully respond. Because it, that is the point, that also the, the accusation, because when you work on the ground, you see that the Ukrainian artillery is also um, shelling.
rallying in that. I mean, in Donetsk, you can hear, I mean, incoming artillery daily. Uh, you can also hear it go outgoing, but. Uh, of course, if uh, rebel separatists uh, shell us, we have to answer for mm -hmm. this. Uh, you mentioned that there won't be money paid for the people living on yeah. the not controlled by the Ukrainian state areas. Okay. So yes. how would these will people this leave? Because there are still many people who just cannot leave the area. So does uh, the Ukrainian uh, state takes away the responsibility from itself not to deliver to the Ukrainian uh, citizens? First of all, we have we try to answer for this extremely difficult question in two ways. First of all, we can say that all people who want to flee from this region can uh, live in Ukraine and take all uh, payments which we have to pay for them. And the second, we will. Uh, uh, we we are go we going uh, to send humanitarian help to this uh, region, and I hope uh, this help, the amount of this help, will be enough for surviving of people. But we can't pay uh, our social responsibilities because we can't, uh, we don't have any guarantee that this money will not uh, use, will not, will not use for military expenditure of these rebels, for this, mm -hmm. et etc. et cetera. But are the Minsk, is the Minsk protocols, are they finished? Can they still work in a no, way? No. Uh, we are trying to be in Minsk pro protocol, mm -hmm. uh, but after this uh, broke, or after the election, we have to respond for this. Mm -hmm. So and it's kind of our response. It's uh, one, for, uh, one way of our responding, and the second way is the reinforce of our position, mm -hmm. as pres the president said. The last question for me. So do you wait for any, ma really like, if to be sure, any major escalation? That's what we see from all the media, that what would be the, all the opinions written, that there will be this escalation. Are we waiting for that? And what the people on the ground should do? I mean, should they flee their houses? Should they stay? Are we waiting for something big with all these threats to take over Mariupol and the other towns in the area? Unfortunately, never say never. Uh, we have uh, to walk, we have, we have a very um, really ugly par uh, counterpart who broke all uh, uh, agreements, and we are waiting for all variant, uh, kinds of development of this situation. But I hope that in the uh, short term, we will, I hope, I, I, don't believe, I don't know, but I hope, I, I do hope that in short term we will not have a full-scale offensive from these guys. Mm -hmm. But it's only it's hard to say. But I, I hope, a, a I can guarantee. A slightly different qu question, since you are okay. involved with the Security Council, um, you know, and there will be discussion, there hasn't been you know, a full secretary, a political appointee. What do you think the qualities are most important for someone who'd lead uh, the head of the Security Council at this time? What do they really need to know? The head is the president. The head is the president, yes. Uh, I have, um, I think that, uh, the secretary uh, is very is very strange position, extremely mm -hmm. strange position. Really, he is an advisor to the president on the issues of national security and defense. And he, from my point of view, mm -hmm. it's my uh, personal um, opinion, he has uh, to be a wise man. He has uh, to be close friend to uh, alliance to the president. Mm -hmm. President uh, has uh, to believe to him. And from my point of view, he uh, maybe it would be better if he doesn't have as huge political ambition. Mm. Because he is uh, disposition for 
bureaucrat, for advisor, but not for very, very to act strong. Lead. Well, it's a very interesting point and something we'll keep in mind as we watch to see who's nominated. And we'd remind the uh, current Ukrainian president was the head of the national security uh, head right after the Orange Revolution. That was the position see, he got. Uh, I want to answer. There is a few different kinds of people who was in this position. It was uh, Vladimir Gorbulin, uh, there was the Vladimir Gorbulin, there was uh, Evgeny Marchuk. I believe like our audience, not everybody and knows the names again, of these people, but in general. Uh, the, um, the president, uh, I, I worked in, in the, the staff of the National Security and Defense Council from 2005 to, uh, till 2000. Seven, and I uh, worked uh, with uh, Poroshenko when he was a secretary. He was a very strong secretary, uh, one mm -hmm. of the more uh, strongest secretaries of uh, this uh, uh, this uh, council. But I think uh, when we have a strong president. Uh, which uh, uh, the, uh, and I think that our president personally and politically is very strong person. It's better. It would be better if the press, uh, the secretary, would be more bureaucrat than mm. politician. And in time of war, in war time, we have to concentrate not on political issue, mm. not on political competition issues, which are all normal politicians are concentrated all the time. No, there's a desire for the position yeah. to be above politics, and with so many strong yeah, political yeah. leaders, it's different. Uh, Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to move okay. to the next section, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, Natalia, thanks so much uh, thank for, and hope to have clear answers always from the national security, also <laughs> following yeah, what's time. happening on the ground. Thanks thank so you. much for this attempt. And for that, we also would like to tell there was a discussion in Kiev cabinets, and not just them, but uh, we can um, also see, and we would like to see what's happened um, on the ground. So there would be another report from a uh, Romatske team working near the village uh, Pirvomaiskaya, uh, where the people could see what is, how is for a civilian to be there, really, really close to the front line, and it still happens every day. Куда деваться? Куда деваться? Куда ехать? 
в гости туда, в Киев, к Порошенко? Или к кому? Или в Россию, к Путину? Куда ехать-то? Нам ехать некуда. Мы сидим здесь. Нас нигде не принимают, нигде нас не ждут. Сидим здесь. Вас это я слышала даже, да? Ну, своими силами кое-как лепим. Еще из проводочка, из кусочка. А что солдаты здесь, которые стоят? Как вы с ними, они с вами? Ребята, на... вот, фу. Ребята нормальные. А их бывает. В семье не без урода. А где вы сейчас живете? Да. Ну, ребенок еще как-то сильно не понимает. Когда начинают бахать, она вот кричит, что бух-бух. Ага. И в машину, и уезжают. Это ее игрушка? Да. Пистолетик? Да. Вот не пистолетик. Достала сегодня, вытащила из своих, только проводила. Пока еще не стреляют, говорю, не надо. То сейчас у нас тихо-тихо, а потом может быть очень шумно. Скажите, ну вот здесь же кулинирия, как бы... Вы же, наверное, слышали об этом. Ну, мы каждый день, мы уже слышим, мы уже не знаем. Мы уже то верим, то уже никому не верим. Такое вот бывает у нас. So as you know, looking at daily life is very important for all of us. And if you look at our YouTube channel for Dramatsk International, you can find more videos like that looking at life on the ground. We've seen what is the life on the front line, but in general the situation in the separatist control area in Donbass and Luhansk is definitely worse. It's somehow not easy for the Ukrainian journalists to get there. There are still foreign journalists working. At the same time, there are many people on the ground. And we try to get to hear all the voices. We have here in the studio people who came from Donetsk, who've lost their fortune there, the volunteers who helped the IDPs, and at the moment, we'd like also to talk uh, with uh, Maria, Marina Cherenkova, who is now currently in Donetsk, and she represents the organization, uh, the volunteer organization, Responsible Citizens, and uh, they are dealing a lot with the humanitarian aid, basically coordinating it a lot with the foreign agencies, uh, going to the places where more, even the humanitarian organization um, don't go because that might be dangerous, uh, and we would like also to ask Marina what really happens now and what is the humanitarian situation. Do people, and Marina, yeah, we already see you, we're happy to have you with us. Tell us what is the situation in Donetsk, what is the situation with the people in the, in the city, in the villages, what do they need, food, energy, anything what is really, you know, we are bothered. Uh, first of all, good evening. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. So, right, from the very beginning, uh, there are about 750, uh, 750,000 people now in Donetsk, but that's not the uh, accurate figure. Uh, around 4 million people are still living uh, in Donetsk and Lugansk oblasts, but that's not accurate as well. We don't know exactly how many people left, how many uh, IDPs uh, are really IDPs, because uh, according to the statistics, not everybody is willing to register. But at this uh, time in Donetsk right now uh, is quiet. Yesterday it was the absolutely uh, mad night and the majority of the citizens were either in the bomb shelters or in uh, the basement of their houses because it was very, very loud, as we say. Uh, we do not know uh, who else is going to help. Uh, I would like to outline those who are living here still with the uh, passports of the citizens of Ukraine. But at this uh, time, there are uh, four major organizations uh, which provide uh, basically the humanitarian assistance. The first is food, and it is provided by Akhmeta Foundation. The second is Doctors Without Borders, and they 
provide uh, their help almost everywhere. That's a very uh, brave people, and uh, we started to cooperate them from with them from the very beginning, and still we are uh, the major partners. And uh, the organization People in Need, um, which is from the very beginning was quite, as we say, in our style. They're helping us with the bomb shelters. At this stage, we are taking care of uh, about 10 bomb shelters. In the most heavy hours, there are about 60, 100, 70, 100 people are there, and they need food, medicine, uh, uh, warm clothes, blankets, um, and everything what the normal person would like to have uh, been or living for four months uh, in bomb shelter, which, um, was, bo which was built uh, during the Soviet Union times. Uh, Marina, can you elaborate? Uh, you know, you mentioned there are some organizations helping, but is it enough? To which extent? To how many people uh, you may reach? And really, are there food? We've seen during this uh, so-called election, you know, alliance people trying to buy vegetables for very cheap because what we heard that there are people really starving. And how is the life in the villages? So, uh, and is it easy for the humanitarian organization to get there and to really deliver if there is a need? That no, there is... Uh, go, uh, a soft two things. First of all, uh, for international missions, to be on the ground means to follow their security protocols, which are quite complicated. Uh, oh, we have... Hello? Unfortunately, yeah, you can speak so far, so we, it's not perfect, the connection, but let's try to keep it short and to tell the main. No, no, no. I, I just can't understand. It's too bad. Um, that's how it happens, that, that is the, the live from Donetsk, what we understand now. Um, so unfortunately we can't probably go, uh, go longer, but then we understand that, uh, what I understand from the previous talks as well with Marina is that, uh, of course the problem is also with the money, people can't get a lot of like their pensions, so, uh, and it's very hard for some organization to operate because of their mandate, so they can't get into some uh, places because of mm -hmm. the security, but there are still people trying. It's mainly thanks to the private people who really, you know, risk their lives. And we'll introduce our guests. Yeah, so we have a panel for you. I mean, you got the first indication from that video. What we're trying to look at is what is life on the ground? How have people been affected? What do they need? And all of those questions. <laughs> and joining us now, so directly to my right, uh, we have Lyubov Mikhailova, uh, who's the founder of Isolatsu, or Isolation, which is um, an initiative for artists, so a platform for cultural initiatives. Uh, they do a lot of different projects. They especially support artists there, originally from Donetsk. They've evacuated to here. And then, uh, to her right, so as we go down the line, uh, we have Natalia uh, Udorovinka, yeah, sorry, <laughs> we're very happy to have as well from uh, Vostok SOS, so an organization that helps IDPs. Now we've thrown that term out, what does that mean? It means internally displaced people, so they are, the colloquially, colloquially the term that's used more widely is refugees, but refugees are people that leave their country for another country, so these are people who are forced to, to flee, to go elsewhere, and to try and find places to live, food, warm clothing, and one of the biggest issues we're looking at now is that winter is approaching and that creates different demands uh, for IDPs, for military, for all of those questions. Uh, but we wanted to start with Lubo first, so I have a video that I am supposed to show and hopefully I will get this going. Do we have, yes, so hopefully this, we should get some footage of your facility there. Um, could you tell us a little bit about Isolatsia, how it started and how, yeah, where it is so now? Yes, actually I understand it's not a topic of today's discussion, but if we look back, then we in follow the history of uh, story of Isolatsia, we'll understand why and what's happened in Donetsk. So in 2010, in the city of Donetsk, which was a very successful, economically developed city, mm -hmm. mostly capital of Ukraine, 
we decided to make a um, foundation for cultural initiative because we have seen in the city of one million people, it was one museum in a very bad condition, no gallery, one commercial gallery, and that's it. Football and beer. So that our initiative was for people who are, who, whose needs are beyond this. So for people who are interested by culture, different mm. view, and different uh, way of living. So for four years of existing Isolatia, we proved that the, how big interest of young generation, especially young generation, was for institutions like ours. Uh, Isolatia becomes for, for four years, we make more than 30 projects, we make a lot of festivals. I can just mention that in April, our last project in April 2014, when it was already Slavyansk, mm. uh, we had um, a Ukrainian um, literature festival with a topic, language and violence. You know, so we, we want, and it's Ukrainian festival, festival of different, it was a different opinion, it was people from Crimea, Tatar, right, Ukrainian, Russian. Uh, so we just wanted to, 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 under, to show that we are different, but that is why it's a beautiful life. We are different, we can accept different opinion without Kalashnikov, we can discuss and we can find a way. Mm. So in, um, but Izalatsa of course has a very strong, uh, we are not political organization, but we mm -hmm. had a very strong uh, civil position and of course all our actions support the democratic processes. Mm. So in, uh, the, uh, in June 9, uh, Izolatsia was seized by militia, one of the militia group of so-called Donetsk Republic. The space Republic. in Isolatsia was a factory, Yes, correct? it was a factory, mm -hmm. seven and a half he hectare, with a beautiful shelf. We just talked here mm. about bomb shelves, with a beautiful Soviet bomb shelves. And this place was seized by, by uh, um, militia, or whatever they call them, Sam Cheka. And now the place uh, with the people with the gangs, under the reason, uh, it has to be used for humanitarian help coming from Russia. The mm -hmm. people with Kalashnikov came to place, and of course we cannot, uh, we have no Kalashnikov. So mm -hmm. they took the place and they said, from now, from June 9, this place will be used for the help, for humanitarian help, uh, which comes from Russia. Uh, since three months we have seen development, and now we know that this is a place where the uh, uh, place with a train of uh, fighters from, I think, Ossetia. Uh, we don't, they don't have names, so the guy who, 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 who a main guy called Mongol. Mm. And there is an, gear, yeah. yeah, there is another, and we, we know that located a big quantity of uh, weapon, so the, oh, maybe this is a humanitarian and there is another organization which called Cheka, the Special Committee. It uh, mm -hmm. has a history of Soviet Union, mm -hmm. where uh, people are, uh, our um, bomb shelter, uh, shelters used as a prison, and they kept more than 100 people. Now we are in contact with the people who were able to escape, so we have some story of the people, what's going on inside of Zalatse. So if this is a help, humanitarian help of Russia, you know, it's such a very bright evidence what's going on with the, the just let's let's uh, um, observer of European uh, observer come inside and watch what's going on mm. so this is a story of Isolatia. we move people we move mm -hmm. um, team here in Kiev and I can say it's a very big quantity of uh, uh, young people and not only young who escape it was a it was here some figures that Donetsk has 750,000 uh, um, 100,000 people, but I can say it's no way. It's thousands and thousands people left Donetsk, and I can tell you with a big responsibility. Uh, we have uh, we have a um, practice, and once per month we meet with the people who left Donetsk. So it's a big mm -hmm. quantity of people, mainly young people, who mm. has who has no uh, w uh, who has no um, will to stay in the place where the gangs, uh, where the where the criminal criminal Mm -hmm. There is no future. So I can say all of these people left Donetsk and um, it's, it's a big humanitarian catastrophe in the way all the... And it's not a clean break either. You have families, some stay and others go and that makes it it's very complicated. My it's question true. then would be also to yeah. Natalia who is actually coordinating the hotline uh, of the um, mm. also established by volunteers organization Vostok SOS, which is the East SOS, would be in English. Today we had the um, Deputy Secretary of the National Security Council who told like people could leave. Really? 
can people from Donetsk leave? Uh, do they have the place to stay? Mm -hmm. uh, how it's all organized? What is the basic need? You know. Uh, so originally, uh, government. Uh, Proceed some procedure how people can do that, but some of them uh, dangerous, some of them simply doesn't work or numbers not answering, and this organization really working not so well. So uh, the only tool uh, IDP have for now, I mean the only working tool, of course, it's uh, it's a volunteering organizations or non-government organizations, and. Um, uh, when they're shooting a lot, like for example, like yesterday in Donetsk mm -hmm. and Lugansk, so we have really a lot of calls and uh, panic. So we also working as uh, psychological help to calm down people, giving some direction what they could do in the question of um, evacuation. What do people ask? Like, what if people who called yesterday? These are people who are in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, within the separatist controlled mm -hmm. areas. Yeah. So. Yesterday and today is a, a more stressful situation, mm -hmm. but if we would, would take the last months, it was more quiet mm -hmm. uh, regarding this kind of peaceful time. But mm -hmm. of course, after, after Minsk, it become much more quiet. Uh, so mostly people was calling not so much as before, as it was June or July or August, but mm. these cases were much more difficult. Like we didn't had. Uh, pensions or social money for three, four months, like it been mentioned already. So of course, the, it's not that much calls, but the situation is much more difficult. How to find the solution for us? Sometimes mm. it's really difficult. And also uh, with the question of the accommodation, like all the government, uh, non-government organization, we are always on the edge of of having requests and having this possibility to accommodate the people. But is there a possibility to accommodate people, you know, on the national level? Does the state provide this accommodation? Do they help you with the vocation of the people who want to leave if they want mm -hmm. to leave? It is possible, but it took twice more efforts. Like, uh, if, if, if they deny you and, and you're not giving up, not many people do that. For example, if 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 they tell me no, we don't have, we are full, no places to mm -hmm. stay. If I'm asking for uh, for paper with uh, with this action from government, then they say, okay, we will find a place for you. But mostly, it's. Uh, well, and that's the challenge because I mean, whether we're looking at military structures or other structures, there there are failures of the governmental system where they can't provide what's needed, and that's when you know volunteers, whether from battalions to people supporting refugees, have come in to fill of, that of void. Of course, it's uh, it's it's possible to endlessly criti criticizing the work of government, but I mm. think the question is that it's really a lot of people are moving. It's it's thousands, it's hundreds of thousands, and and government never been ready for that. And in this respect, I just want to step away from the topic we, to, uh, we talk now. And I want to say that there is a, the main question, there is no infrastructure of support, you know, no infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We need yeah. this, we need that, but exactly. we don't work on infrastructure. So in this case, I just want to say that this year, the Pritzker Architectural Prize 2014, the most important architectural prize in the world, got Japanese architect Shigeru Ben for his disaster architecture, for his works, which he does in Africa, in zone of disaster, how they organize places for living for people in disaster. I think Ukraine and places need, we have so many abundant industrial places. Let's do something where we can take people with a big quantity, uh, use possibility of, of infrastructure, because we cannot go one by one, paper by paper. It's very difficult. Yeah. Lubov, there is a question for you, because besides you uh, work with, uh, you founded the, this cultural platform, Izolatsia, you owning the fact you I used own, to own. You used to own. Oh, yes. You used to own two factories yeah. in Horlovka and Stachano, yeah. which are the don't, don't. Uh, you know under the uh, it's in Luhansk and Donetsk um, People's Republic. What happened to the employees? What happened to the people who work? Do they get any money? Where are they staying? They are not. They are exactly the people who don't have any savings. We talk to them. They have nothing. 
Yeah, situation is like this because you know we were uh, it's industrial part of Donetsk and uh, Lugansk region and Gorlovka and Stakhanov suddenly we are in two different the one company becomes in two different countries. Mm -hmm. So but both of them has no infrastructure, no possibility to deliver raw materials, supply uh, supply products and so on. So the rail trucks rail rail system is completely destroyed, energy system, electricity destroyed. So since uh, July I can say industry falls down. Uh, I don't know this miracle how, how Mr. Akhmetov managed to be able to not to, to work with his plans and how the infrastructure is not uh, blocked his, uh, mm -hmm. but probably he knows some extra special work, some tools, some tools you know. Hurt, yeah. But for, for usual businessmen, for foreign investor, it mm -hmm. doesn't, we don't know this in this country, Donetsk and uh, Lugansk Republic. So uh, I can say that uh, the people has their two, two third salaries, but we understand now, so we had a hope from June, July, that situation will be improved. And now we understand that there is no hope. So mm -hmm. we start to inform people, according to Ukrainian law, uh, that in three months we have to uh, we have to, to finish mm -hmm. uh, the company. So, but by this moment, a lot of people left themselves. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people left in Russia. I can say honestly, mm -hmm. a lot of people left to Russia, and there is uh, some people who stay still in Gorlovka or Stakhanov and have they have no chance to move somewhere. And mm -hmm. this is the people, uh, the point where I think we're all responsible, Especially and we're all limited people. Uh, we're all responsible, and we have to to do something for this and um, I've heard here this uh, discussion before that we have to discuss Minsk or not Minsk. So I think it's still Ukrainian people and we have to make efforts mm. to, to support these people somehow. Well, and this is the issue too. I mean, in the summer, from people I'd spoken to, there mm -hmm. were, uh, you know, some people at least in Donetsk and Luhansk mm -hmm. who were waiting to see. You know, people had businesses, they had things that were there, they didn't yeah. want to just leave it. Or even if they just had an apartment, they were concerned that if, you know, they just went, something would be broken into and, and all that money would be lost. So they were hoping, and maybe even beginning of September, there is some enthusiasm that maybe things yes. will normalize, people will get paid, and it won't be perfect, but you can stay because obviously it's much harder to go. But as this has gone on, I think that's something fewer people believe. I mean, when people call the hotline for SOS Vostok, are they trying to plan to leave? Are they looking for that kind of support? We trying in some point kindly um, inspire them to start new life because okay. of course, we, we don't know, and some some regions are so much destroyed. So when people living in some, we calling the places of compact uh, dislocation, somehow like uh, some uh, hotel or mm -hmm. it's like 200 people the same place, we can see from international experience that it's not so effective. So people hoping and waiting, uh, not associating that well in society. So mm -hmm. we're trying to in inspire them to find a job. Also, we uh, giving all kind of connection to find a job, to to how to bring kids to the school, to kindergartens, mm -hmm. and so on. Of course, helping with accommodation, helping uh, how to register in the new place, mm. how to get some social money. And but so is it hard because from, from some people I've spoken to, there mm. can also be cases of discrimination that people mm. from Donetsk and Luhansk have a hard time renting an apartment Absolutely. or maybe in finding a job? I, I can say two cases. First, of course, uh, uh, looking for places. <clears throat> the situation a little bit like this is true. The prices are higher, and uh, sometimes people don't want to take these people from Lugansk and Donetsk region. But, but why? What's the image of them, or what makes them not want to? Um, mostly, these people simply confused. They simply don't know what to expect from these uh, IDPs. Mm -hmm. uh, would they stay for long, or are you giving the place for rent and they will leave in two months? So mm -hmm. if you if you uh, more self-confident, you're talking to this landlord that I want to stay for at least a year, and they see you personally, then it works fine. Mm -hmm. But also today I had another example uh, with one social worker from Switzerland. We visited today one place where uh, 150 people lives and uh, 45 kids. And we had this special question, question uh, how kids uh, uh, go into school, mm -hmm. do they have some problems with uh, other kids? And they say, no, we had no cases like this. So hmm. kids can assimilate really, really well. Um, so uh, that would be the last question uh, for me. Um, Lubov, that 
probably shortly as well. You've lived there in Donetsk for a long time. You have huge business there. And there is this idea of kind of a frozen conflict. Are you going to back? What will you do with your business? And how the people of like you, what they think about the whole idea of the special status, if to be short? To be short, I can say that uh, one story with this area, we don't know what's happened because uh, we don't know what's in the head of these people. Another story of behavior of Ukraine, who act absolutely inadequate to investors. So being investor, being completely ruined in this part of of uh, Ukraine. I have no support, even opposite, from Ukrainian government, national bank, tax authorities, so no understanding. As investor, I tell you, I would rather go to Venezuela and Latin America. That's what we know now, and for, thank you for joining and getting this insight, inf in, information from uh, Donbass, the east of Ukraine, and to see how the people live there near the front line, not really there. We can also um, follow our journalistic job of our reporters on the ground. Thank you. And it's in Pervomaisk, really close to Donetsk. Света нет, воды нет. Ну и все остальное. А кто-то что-то делает или как? Или... В смысле? Ну, то есть чем-то занимается или куда-то или уже нет? У потому нет что... работы тут вообще никак. Мы ж вообще здесь все работали в Донецке. Ага, а теперь никто никуда а не ездит. А теперь в Донецк, во-первых, не выпускают нас. Вообще не пускают? Ну дорога-то закрыта. Вот, все. В Донецк мы вообще не, не, не хуже уже... С, июня, с июля месяца. Как начали вот нас бомбить, и все, и нам закрыли дорогу. И, и тоже и пенсии не платят. Ничего, и... ни зарплат, ни пенсии, нету ничего у людей. И Мы как живем. живут? Что ну, на огородах же. Кто картошку повыкапывал? Ну, свое, с огорода. Ребята, слава богу, вот фу, -фу, фу дай бог, им здоровье помогают, вот пенсионерам, бабушкам. Они носят, они конечно, носят свою, кушают. да, макароны там, ну, тушенку. Помогают. Вот. Я говорю, есть человечные люди, есть. А другие, я говорю, есть такие, что наоборот приедут еще и... Заберут что -то? Нет, они у нас, у, нас, у нас не забирают. Нет, ну просто, знаете, когда, как, как говорится, как напьются, начинают ходить, орать. Ага. Так что одни ходят, успокаивают, другие, наоборот, пугают. Вы знаете, сейчас даже в доме опасно. Раньше как-то бежали в комнату и прятались. Вот у меня подруги в комнате спряталась, а ей прям вот в дом попали два снаряда. И Это она чудом, же... что они из прихожки нырнули в ванную. И в ванной вот они остались живы. А если бы они вот так в прихожке сидели, их бы там обоих уже с сыном уже, наверное, похоронили. А были погибшие здесь? Нет, у нас только умирают от старости. От старости, от стрессов. Ну, в основном от стрессов. Вот. Не выдерживает психика у людей. Они уже... Сердце. Сердце, да. Сердце. И молодые умирают, и с ума уже сходят. От этих баханей каждый, каждый день. Оно еще как в полях, вот там вот где-то ложится. Оно как -то, а когда по домам начинают, уже люди все, у их психика не выдерживает. Даже мужики, уже смотрю, мужики уже все, уже ходят по дороге, орут как, как сумасшедшие. Знаете, у нас такое уже мнение, что наши все олигархи что-то делят, а мы страдаем. Ну все, у нас... Я говорю, было бы, что у нас были бы мы тут богатые, зажиточные, а живем же на одну пенсию, да на зарплату. Ну вот, в основном, поуезжали, у кого дома все разбиты, спалили. Ну, на том краю люди еще как-то подъезжают, возвращаются, потом начинают стрелять, опять убегают, то в Красноармейск, то в Украинск, ну, туда подальше. А так, страшно. Ой, стреляют каждый день. Каждый день. Вот сегодня стреляли. Да, с утра? Да, ночью стреляли. Не поймем. Минометы, да? Но... Бывает станка, бывает град. Тут, тут не предугадаешь. Вот сейчас тишина, сейчас, может, через пять минут там бахнет, а сюда прилетит, разорвется. Ну, люди вот красные. Я говорю, всю жизнь дом строили, строили. И... Дом сгорел, 
И хозяин сразу не выдержал. Наверное, через месяц сердце встало, умер, похоронили. Ужас. Очень страшно. Натворили чудес. И что дальше будет? И когда будет мир? Кто мне скажет? Кто ответит? Welcome back. Uh, now we're going to be joined by John Herps, the director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia program and the U.S.'s ambassador to Ukraine from 2003 until 2006. Hope we'll be pulling him up on Skype any moment now. Oh, perfect. <laughs> It's wonderful when, wonderful when technology works. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So we just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what's changed after the midterm election in the U.S., uh, specifically in the Senate, but just how these elections could affect U.S. foreign policy. Well, there's this, this little question that the Republicans who want a sweeping majority uh, in the Senate, as to add to their majority in the House, taking more active uh, and uh, a more active role in foreign policy and are willing to engage where President Obama seems to be reluctant. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, is it true, generally, you know, there's the image that Democrats love peace, Republicans love war, um, but in the case of Ukraine, what we really look at is uh, support and aid to Ukraine. Is there a track record of Republicans like Senator John McCain being more willing to support Ukraine and aid than Democrats in the Senate? I think that there is a substantial bipartisan majority in both the Senate and the House in support of providing some assistance to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. not, just, not just assistance in the form of sanctions, where President Obama is pretty good, but actual military equipment, where President mm -hmm. Obama is frankly weak. Because it seems like, uh, you know, what you pointed out, the big divide is, you know, medical aid, you know, passive aid, defense armor versus providing any sort of weapons or something that could give Ukraine a tactical advantage. And the issue here, the way Ukrainians look at it, of course, is they see these convoys entering from Russia and going into eastern Ukraine. Um, has, there been, has there been any shift in that sort of aid, or is it too soon to tell what could happen in the Senate? There, there is growing understanding in Washington mm -hmm. that Mr. Putin is pursuing an aggressive policy in Ukraine and is willing to pursue, pursue an aggressive policy elsewhere. As you know, when President Poroshenko visited Washington, he made a strong appeal for military equipment. And that very day, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, both Democrat and Republican, voted unanimously to provide military assistance to Ukraine. President Obama has what I would call the misconceived notion that if we somehow provide military to Ukraine, that's provocative, when Russia's not only sending military equipment and money, but also sent in its own troops just in August to stop the then successful counteroffensive that was being conducted by President Poroshenko. So I believe the United States will move, if the President doesn't, then Congress will, to provide military aid to Ukraine. So, but the main conflict you see is not between Democrats and Republicans, but rather between President Obama and senators working there, that, where the Senate and people from both sides of the aisle are willing to provide support, but so far that's been kind of knocked down by President Obama, is that correct? That's, that's correct, but I would go even farther. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is clearly the President's position, a misguided one, as I've already mentioned, but there are senior people. <clears throat> in his own administration, who have argued for this unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. No, but what are the reasons for this position? I mean, you've said it's misguided, but what, what are the factors or what is the logic they see for supporting it? Well, the arguments, there have been two major arguments offered. One has some legitimacy, although it can be dealt with. The other, I think, is completely bogus. The one that has some legitimacy is there is a serious problem of corruption in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So the idea is if you send this equipment, who knows what happens to it? Mm -hmm. But the way to deal with that, of course, is to provide effective monitoring. We can do that, and I'm sure the Ukrainian authorities will be willing to allow us to monitor, monitor this intensively to make sure that the, that equipment, in fact, is delivered to Ukraine's forces who are fighting against aggression in the East. That's argument one. Argument two is the one I've already mentioned. That it would be provocative to Russia, and it would somehow lead to an escalation of the crisis. In fact, what we've seen is, precisely because the West has not provided military aid, Uh, Mr. Putin has escalated half a dozen times. No, I mean, I think that's uh, a good point. People in the West are often worried about escalation, but 
escalation seems to be proceeding no matter what, and it doesn't, the role that the U.S. plays doesn't seem to affect it too much. But do you think there's truth to the fact that, you know, this is a more important conflict to Russia, that Russia is more invested and willing to wait, you know, kind of gamble more on it than the U.S. is? Well, certainly the Kremlin has decided it is willing to commit aggression to make sure that the Ukrainian people could not choose their own future. Mm -hmm. It's also true that the West has, un has been unwilling to provide what I would say is a sufficiently strong response. Mm -hmm. But that's because they don't understand what's driving Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin has a revisionist agenda, which concerns not just Ukraine, it concerns all places, or potentially all places, where there are not just ethnic Russians, but Russian speakers outside of Russia. Mm -hmm. So his agenda is very dangerous. And not all Western leaders and publics understand this. But again, people are becoming smarter about this problem. No, I mean, is there a sense that uh, Senator McCain would be the right person to confront that? Or who's seen as the person who understands Russia the best in the Senate at this point? Well, I, I don't know who's the best mm. Russian scholar in the Senate. I think that Senator McCain has a pretty good idea about this problem. I think Senator Menendez, who is still the uh, head of the Foreign Relations Committee, a Democrat, has mm. a very good understanding of this. Again, eight, all senators on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee voted just a couple of months ago to provide military equipment to Ukraine. So this problem, again, is, is understood by, both by Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. So it's not a party issue. All right, very interesting. Thank you very much for your time. Some interesting You're insight welcome. coming in from Washington, D.C. My pleasure. So we talk about what happens, uh, you know, about discussion about the weapon, will it be there, what would be any military aid or any kind of aid. But what we would like to tell, you know, it's, it, looks very different on the ground. It's called 30-second checkpoint, and it is based really close to Luhansk, the city where even for reporters had to uh, get. Our Hromatsky team was there, and this is the area where the group of the Ukrainian military used to stay but had to leave. Uh, many of them uh, were killed, so the area around was uh, full of the different kind of mines, and more or less there was an agreement between the separatists and the Ukrainian army to get the bodies of the dead soldiers from the area, uh, yet the situation is still very much tense. So how the war looks like, that's what we will show you now. Ми зараз на 31-му блокпості, на цьому блокпості стоять бійці Нацгвардії, хлопці з Вінниці, і це останній блокпост в тому напрямку по трасі на Бахмутку. За ним має бути 32-й блокпост, але перед ним стоять, на жаль, вже сепаратистські блокпости. Вони поставили свій блокпост між двома блокпостами української армії, і, власне, хлопці на 32-му блокпосту знаходяться Оточені, і до них не можна дістатися. Ми чекаємо зараз машину із загиблими звідти. Сепаратисти обіцяли їх віддати. Половина передають один, два, один, два. На самому ділі то не один, два, а тут десятки, а не один, два. Керівництво мало забирати їх звідти, а війська вводити. А... Потрібно їх звідти забирати просто на Не перебили всі. Вони так потроху і всіх і до нас стало тоді. Наша той блокпост, якщо ти дорогу не контролюєш. Скільки там їм, скільки вони можуть пройти? Тиждень, два. І пощі. Ще країні потрібні герої. І 100 чоловік для за що? 100 чоловік. Сітельно. Ну, кожен день договарю, говорять, що відправляють нам машину, да? Я ну да, відправляю там воду, все. Ну, все прекрасно знають, що це все, вона не доходить. З будь-якої сторони, з якої не приїжджають, ну, надо отдать їм должное, вони адекватні, да? Оппоненты, да, все сепаратисты. Они все эти машины просто-напросто разворачивали обратно, не брали ни в плед, ничего. Машина приходит, они ее развернули, машина ушла обратно. А начальство отрапортовались, все, мы, мы отдали. 
Благо, вчера они нам пропустили на 100 с чем-то, на 100 с лишним человек, 200 литров воды, мешок макарон, пару мешков хлеба и ящик мыла. У нас как раз не выстачает воды и пищи. Теплых вещей не хватает. У вас нема что есть, либо человек уже хлеба в руках. Это я... Будем говорить, а как дозволили забрать загиблю? Як... Да они не, не до что дозволили, они сами уже, наверное, тиждень выходят на керівництво и говорят, что заберите трупы, потому что их животное порастягивают. Вот сегодня уже, со вчерашнего дня, вот напрямую они сказали, заберите, потому что пусть похоронят по-человечески. Вот и мы сейчас доставали, не знаю, 8 или 9. А кто, знаете? Не знаем, это, блин, это техника. Ну что дебилизм посылать на помощь по 2-3 машины. Оно все стоит по дороге сожженное. Там от кого-то остались кусок руки, нога, еще что-то. Все. А вы тоже с нас Я с регулярных ворсов. Алло, алло. Десантник? Да. А десантников они пропускают, да? Они всех выпускают. И нас гвардию тоже. Но они это приказывают. Да, нету приказовые. И вы возвращаетесь сейчас назад? Если мы не вернемся, они просто-напросто могут взять, штурмануть все, всех, кто там есть. И сколько вас приехало? Да. Нас приехало. Пять человек. А как там вообще парни? То есть это правда, что в кольце? Это правда. Это правда, что в кольце. Причем кольцо уже готовилось и делалось очень давно. У них позиции укрепленные. Они закопаны. Не за день, не за день. Стоит полковник Чумак. Вот и все. All right, welcome back. So as you know, as we had in that video, we like to focus on things on the ground, but what happens outside of Ukraine's border also has a tremendous significance for Ukraine. That's why we have our Media Moment segment here with Vladimir Gyrmolenko of Internews. We have a great graphic for that. Oh, there we go. All right, we're back. And joining us is the man of the hour. <laughs> so what can Hello. you tell us about the news this week? Well, the first, the, the first interesting thing is basically the anniversary of the, of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And here the debate is very interesting because uh, Mr. Gorbachev came to the media and said basically he, that he, he joins, he a little bit joined the, the feeling of, of Vladimir Putin and launched the arguments which are really in the strand of, of Putin's argument in the Valdez speech saying that uh, it is Russia and German cooperation, which is the basis for security in Europe, and that mm -hmm. the, it is the fault of the West, which is now the, the, the causes of, 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 uh, of events now. And it's, it's quite an interesting thing and, and quite a dangerous thing, I mm -hmm. would say. I would refer to, this, uh, to, several, uh, to several media publications. Another thing is um, uh, an interview of Genscher, of Hans-Dietrich Genscher, the, the ex-foreign minister of, of Germany at that time, at the, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, in which he shares pretty much the same sentiment, mm -hmm. saying that well, we need to re-establish cooperation between Russia and Germany, and, and here we come to a very dangerous point, I think, that these people who brokered this fall of the Berlin Wall are now the advocating a renewal of Russian and Germany, you know, cooperation. Thinking, I think, in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, seeking peace of, mm -hmm. of that epoch, but it seems to be that now this logic is obsolete. You mentioned that in this medium, which probably the audience can also read and read all the articles, that Russia and the West need a compromise over the Crimea. That was also one of the topics brought. Yeah, this so is. So, what, what, what does it mean? You know, this. What? How they want to bring this? Uh, well, I call it a new, of... new kind of a new logic of appeasement, which is very dangerous and which is present in some of the Western media. And this article in Independent was was written by two Russian journalists. I think it's it's kind of a also very, very paradoxical, we, because it's an, an attempt to come back to business as usual between Russia and the West, 
uh, thinking that we should give a new status to Crimea or whatever and to postpone the real solution of, of, of the problem. So do they think that's possible to bring it I back th to I think was? not, but the dangerous thing is that these topics are discussed. So they the, the authors media. think it is yeah. possible to get but, there. But mm -hmm. another, another thing is these critics of this appeasement, and it's, uh, there is a very interesting article by Linus Lenkevich, who's the Lithuanian mm -hmm. foreign minister uh, in The Guardian, who yeah, is basically... Yeah, show the piece. How does it yes. look now? That would be the next one. Yeah. Who is basically one by next. saying this that... This one? Is that what you want? Yeah, no, 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 the, the this next one. one yeah. Yeah, this one, this All right. one. There we go. Uh, who is drawing <laughs> attention to this, uh, Putin's remark that uh, molotov ribbentrop Pact is a good thing. Mm. And uh, it's a good thing because Soviet Union in that way tried to escape war. Mm. And this is again the logic of, of Putin saying, well, if you're saying that Putin Ribbentrop Act is a, is a bad thing, then the, you're saying that Munich agreements in 38 is a good thing. And I try to say the reverse. Mm. Now, Linkevich is, is saying very, very interesting, very important thing that basically if we support this, if we don't pay attention to this, we can, be, we can become a victim of the same pact. Mm -hmm. Now, the next topic uh, is uh, kind of a, for me, it's a kind of a paradoxical sort of thing, is the Forbes estimation Putin uh, as um, the, the most mm -hmm. powerful man in the world, the second in a row, it was the last year and, and this year, uh, and it's kind of a strange argumentation behind it, because for me personally, uh, well, Russia is uh, eight times a lesser, smaller economy than the US. La Russia is eight times smaller economy than the European Union. Russia is dependent 80% on raw materials exports. Russia's uh, attempts, uh, integration attempts have been mostly a failure because the Eurasian Union doesn't work so much. And still, there is certain logic in the West uh, calling Putin the most powerful man in the world, mm. which is kind of a sign for me, a, a kind of a Western masochism, you know. Well, what do they base it on? Why do they say he's the well, most powerful man? Well, saying that Putin influences the agenda, you know. Putin mm -hmm. is unpredictable. Putin is, is doing something which, which we cannot really react to. So they buy into but the strongman image. Yeah, yeah, but my, my metaphor is that imagine we are in the neighborhood and we have a, a, a drug addict, you know, who who is constantly influencing the agenda because he attempts to rape somebody or he, he attempts to uh, rob a, a shop, and then we don't call, call this drug addict and the most influential person of, 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 the, of the neighborhood, right? Well, but, I mean, that's a moral question where they're talking about influence. I mean, you can do things that are wrong or punishable or illegal and still have a tremendous influence. Yeah, exactly, right? but, yeah, exactly, but uh, they called it the most powerful man. And mm -hmm. here we come to the question of power, mm -hmm. and I think that Putin is not that powerful because, for example, for example, if we analyze his Valdai speech, it's mm -hmm. a speech of a weak man who is uh, feeling itself himself surrounded by enemies. There are so a lot of uh, writing and articles about possible uh, escalation. So, what is the take on the major media on that? You know, do they have any new m new information that we don't? Well, I don't think they have new information, but there is a very interesting article r r written by Stéphane Sion, uh, the French journalist, uh, for the paper Le Temps, and he, all, he, he, he basically he tries to make a prognosis, he, uh, he tries to make a forecast, saying there are signs that, they will be, that things will get worse on, on Donbass, yes. And uh, at, at the same time, there is a stronger, stronger criticism of the EU and US policy, and there is an editorial from Washington Post uh, very much criticizing Joe Biden, Joe Biden's remark that basically we, we still keep things under control. And uh, this editorial is saying that uh, Putin is basically they is saying what we know, that Putin is repeating the scenario of Moldova and Georgia now in Ukraine. And you uh, wanted to point out the publication from the Ukrainian media on the gas deal, so um, which is considered to be at least some achievement from this negotiation that the Kiev resident at least won't uh, be frozen this winter. Yeah, exactly, but there is much criticism from the expert community, and I draw attention to the comment of Mikhail Honchar, who is one of the most interesting experts on energy in Ukraine. He's saying basically that 
Crimean issue, Crimean package was not in the deal. And asking why, because Ukraine can be in debt of 3 billion euro for, for Russian gas, but in the negotiations, this Crimean issue, the, 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 the issue that the assets, Ukrainian assets, Ukrainian NAFTA gas assets, Ukrainian uh, gas fields in Crimea were simply annexed, mm. and this issue was not raised during the gas negotiations. So what we, uh, you point out also on something about the, um, the next one, what I understand would be um, not just about the West and Ukraine, but also about the... Yeah, this is a, a very good article in, in, in CNN uh, saying uh, under the title why Ukraine is vital for the West. Uh, it's interesting because the article is trying to, to, to point to the fact that the West should probably think in terms of interest also, not only in terms of values, but also in terms of interest, and consider the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian situation currently from this point of view, from the point that the, the Western civilization is a kind of a, a trying to enlarge in this, with this Ukrainian crisis, and it's hmm. not helping, helping the, 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 the weak. Hmm. Yes. And the last two articles, well, probably this one, we, we can stop here. And uh, this is kind of a picture of the Russian society by a very interesting sociologist, Alexei Levinson, from the Levada Center. The brilliant Russia, uh, article in Russian, but it's, I would just raise, I would like to raise one single point, is the idea that the double thing, the concept of double thing, which is an Orwellian concept. 1984. Uh, 1984. Yeah. It's coming novel. back to Russian society, Russian mentality, because cu currently Russian society is thinking in terms of contradictions is thinking one thing and at the same time thinking another thing, hmm. the other thing which is contradictory. For example, he gives an example of Stalin. Well, Stal the figure of Stalin was reevaluated during the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Stalin was considered as a torturer, but still for contemporary Russian, he is still a hero. But he said that that double thing had stopped for a while in the 90s or early 2000s? Well, probably, yes, he doesn't say that, but okay. it seems it's to me that it, it kind of stopped there, but now it's coming back. And uh, the issue, look at the Valdai speech again. This, this will be our reference for a long time, I think, because in the Valdai speech, Putin, it, it was very anti-Western, very aggressively anti-Western, anti but at the same time it was kind of a resending back the Western arguments, saying that we are better West than, than you are. That's hmm. what we talk about, about the Russian society, so how about the Ukrainian? The that Ukrainian you something, you, you, that's something you also point out in your media monitor this week. Yes, but it's just, uh, I would like to, to, to raise uh, attention, to, to, to draw attention to some, to an article on the Guardian, which I think is misleading. So uh, I, I just pointed, uh, pointed to it to, to, to argue that this is misleading, because this is an article trying to make a review of far-right return of the far-right politics in Europe and uh, comparing the Ukrainian situation with the victory of, of Front National in France and of UKIP in the United Kingdom, whereas this is precisely the fact which some Western observers don't, 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 ma don't mention, that uh, on, the, on the terms of electoral, electoral things, the Ukrainian far-right and radical mm -hmm. politics has lost uh, substantially during the presidential elections and during the parliamentary elections. Hmm. So um, that was pretty, um, really detailed description of what was very interesting, uh, the headlines. Thanks so much waiting for, to hear what would be, uh, what we will hear the next week and what would be on the front lines of the foreign media. But at the same time, we also would like to tell what is happening on the, uh, on the ground. And there is a story of the helipad here in Kiev, which Half a year after the revolution, after the Maidan, uh, still belongs to the um, Renat Akhmetov Ukrainian oligarch company, and it was found out that a lot of money had been paid to Yanukovych's son. Therefore, what is special about this story is that there was not the regular police, not the law enforcement agencies, but the volunteer battalions who, come, who came from the front line and uh, tried to stop uh, what's happening there and took the role of the police, which um, created a lot of discussion here in Ukraine, and, but you can see how it had happened.
приехал прокурор, зампрокурора города. То есть это помещение принадлежит семье Янукович? Ну, в принципе, через обшор, да. аренда, которые уходят в офшорные зоны аренды. Почему эти деньги не идут в бюджет государства нашего, нам непонятно. Почему до сих пор люди, которые убежали из страны, по которым открыты уголовные дела, получают деньги с этой страны? Это вопрос остается загадкой. Того, чтобы заниматься войной мы занимаемся непонятно чем а сейчас идут полноценные боевые действия а мы занимаемся здесь работой милиции прокуратуры Я сам документы не снимаю. Я снимаю процесс, как вы их пакуете. Так, а это следствие за кордоном в Лондоне, королевство Уэльс, 95% коштів, которые находятся на своем предприятии, переходят за кордон, потому что поступает Януковичем. И из какого-то это привода так выявили, что прокуратура генеральная возбудила голову справу в квитне месяце, а на это пока не приехали мы. Что-то никто не выяснил, почему предприятие работает, почему кошти не входят в бюджет и до фонда не А до, доходят то же самое Януковича.
Now, here at the end of the show, we like to take a look at one event of the week and focus on that a bit more. Today marks the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is being celebrated in Germany. Uh, we have one image of that because to sell and mark that date, they have an installation of about 8,000 poles with lit balloons on it. We can see it there. And they're marking the old uh, border between West and East Berlin. Now, now we have some other footage that's coming up a bit fast, but we'll get to that too. Um, for people in Germany, and especially in Berlin, many of these historical questions have faded into the past, being parts of spheres of influence and going through daily checkpoints. But looking forward, there are still questions. Now, Gorbachev, the former head of the Soviet Union who is there and visiting, talked about how this was today, we're also looking at the start of a new Cold War. Those are hard statements to prove right or wrong, but they show the extent to which they're still in people's memory. And as something like the West, West Berlin and East Berlin and borders and crossings move into a period of memory and remembrance in the West, or at least in Germany, in Ukraine, they continue to be very relevant. Uh, we had footage before showing the construction of a wall. No, that's between Russia and Ukraine. But what many people are familiar with, especially when they're coming and moving between Luhansk uh, in the separatist-controlled areas and Donetsk to say Dnepropetrovsk are border checkpoints. And so these issues of East and West and influence and not being able to freely move or just having restrictions are ones people know. And the situation that Ukraine is in today is in many ways an outgrowth of the fall of the wall and of this change in systems. It's what gave Ukraine the chance to be independent, and it's that independence that still Ukraine struggles with to a certain extent. As we know, uh, we've seen this footage uh, that indeed for these 24 years and 25 years, there were basically no border between Russia and Ukraine, no even really clear demarcation. Um, so we are be following, and there is a discussion, which is very strange in 2014, to have a discussion about the wall. Um, yet, uh, when there is a discussion in the cabinets, uh, there is a real impact on the life, on the people on the ground here in Ukraine, not just here and that's what we are here for from Kiev studio to let you know what happens in Ukraine, not just in Ukraine really, because it became, you know, some kind of a, a, an important place for the international politics. With that, we encourage you to follow our social networks, Facebook, Twitter, um, at Hromatske, uh, our medium, and we'll be back in a week here to discuss the most important issues of the next week. Летіли у світ, сказав їх один позитивний чувак, почувши їх прозріли всі, війна прийшла під кожен дах. Уходили хлопці на війну, за ними наступні збиралися, усі обіцяли вернутися, але не всі верталися. Все туди на фронт, наші базана. Все туди на фронт, наші базана. Let's
Захисти їх там, не стріляють гради. Там поруч з героями Майдану воюють перкутубійці, ветерани Афганістана і молоді гвардійці. Усі чекають відмашки і рвуться в бій, піднявши прапор державний свій. Але немає наказу і знову вертатися на базу. Все туди на фронт. Захисти їх там, не стріляють гради. Серед сепаратистів боється плоту, з яким ти бився. Ти маєш щастя його зустріти і все йому пояснити. Мирним людям не зрозуміти війну, не можна так просто спинити. Нам випала наша доля, і ми з тим будемо жити. Все туди на фронт нашим пацанам. Все туди на фронт нашим пацанам. Слава Україні! Слава вам, хлопці! Три громадські головне підсумок дня сьогоднішнього приведу... Я Сергій Мельничук, я сьогодні випусковий редактор, ведучий, таке у нас буває, це ж громадське. Отже, одна з основних тем дня сьогоднішнього, звичайно, це обговорення постачання Російською Федерацією військової техніки на Донбас. Ну, власне, продовжується ця практика в Донецьку та Макіївській. Це території, які підконтрольні так званим Донецьким, так званим очільникам ДНР, вчора було помічено колони важкої техніки та танків. Про це, власне, йдеться у сьогоднішній доповіді моніторингової місії ОБСЄ в Україні. За даними місії, на околицях Макіївки був помічений конвой з більш ніж 40 вантажівок та цистерн, що рухалися на захід. З них 19 – це великі вантажівки типу КАМАЗ, тентовані без маркування чи номерних знаків. Кожен буксирував 122-мм гаубицю. До речі, ці 122-міліметрові гаубиці здатні робити постріли десь на 30 кілометрів, якщо я не помиляюся. Так само були помічені близько 9 танків, 4 Т-72 та 5 Т-64. Разом з тим журналісти Associated Press опублікували в соцмережах відео, на якому згадувана військова техніка біля 80 одиниць неподалік Донецька та Сніжного прямою. Бачите ці кадри зараз на своїх екранах, отже КАМАЗи їдуть, за ними причеплені гаубиці 122-мм, також їдуть бензовози, тут я так бачу і польові кухні так само є, і особовий склад в цих КАМАЗах. Ну, звісно, це свідчить про те, що продовжується ескалація конфлікту на Сході України, і точно це не українська сторона займається цією не дуже благородною, скажімо так, справою. Ну, менше з тим, ми сьогодні телефонували нашим бійцям на передову, зокрема в Донецький аеропорт телефонували, так що телефонували маршалу. Кажуть бійці, що вони готові до відбиття атак. Зокрема, наприклад, боєць допровольчого українського корпусу з опозиним Яшка сказав, що вони готові палити російські танки, так само, як вони палили БТР на Інститутській, і вони вже готують для цього коктейлі Молотова. Маршал вже, в свою чергу, нам телефоном розповів про те, що 
Насправді, та інформація, яка сьогодні була поширена про бій в аеропорті, вона не є правдивою. Зазначив він, що ситуація контрольована, проте бойовики активізувалися і вже дві доби дуже жорстко луплять по об'єкту та наших підрозділах. Ця новина є у нас на сайті громадська.тв. Якщо ви не чули пряму мову маршала, можете заходити на сайт і слухати самі. З Росії перекинули важку артилерію. Це так само маршал знає. Він так знає його побратин в Донецькому аеропорті. Поставили вони свою артилерію в житлових районах і не можуть українські військовослужбовці стріляти по населених районах, і цього не роблять, а бойовики цим користуються. Ну, в усякому разі, про це розповів нам маршал. Повідомив він нам, що, в принципі, бійці знають і про кількість техніки ворожої, яка зайшла до міста. В принципі, про все вони знають і до всього готуються. В цілому ж він сказав, що ситуація важка, але контрольована, я повторюся. Ну, а між тим, поки війна продовжується на сході України, Центральна виборча комісія планує вже завтра у вечері встановити результати парламентських виборів за пропорційною складовою. У всякому разі таку заяву сьогодні зробив Михайло Хендовський. Водночас оголосити результати голосування за мажоритарною складовою ЦВК зможе не в усіх одномандатних округах, що зумовлене рішенням суду про перерахунок голосів на виборчих дільницях в низці округів. За словами Хендовського, обрані в таких округах депутати зможуть розпочати роботу трошки пізніше. В цілому ж Верховна Рада вже може збиратися на засідання. Але, в принципі, ці вибори, скажімо так, пройшли не без інцидентів. Так, наприклад, один із лідерів партії «Воля», кандидат в народні депутати від об'єднання «Самопоміч» Єгор Соболів сьогодні склав свої повноваження і вийшов з партії. Голова громадського ілюстраційного комітету вийшов зі складу партії. Про це він заявив під час третіх позачергових національних зборів партії «Воля», які проходили в Києві. Також він заявив, що вважає помилкою, що будував партію разом разом із активістом і народним депутатом Юрієм Дерев'янком. Як повідомлялося раніше, пан Соболєв звинувачував Дерев'янка в розколі всередині партії «Воля». Разом із ним партія залишили ще два кандидати в депутати – Вікторія Войцицька та Павло Костенко. Ну і так само свіжа, ну більш-менш свіжа новина. Наталка Гоменюк трошки поспішила і трошки невірно дала інформацію. Вона чи не... Не казала вона про це, та? Ну тоді і вибачатися не будемо. Голова Служби безпеки Валентин Наливайченко заявив про те, що сьогодні Служба безпеки України, не не сьогодні, а взагалі, він сьогодні заявив, що Служба безпеки України затримала одного із заступників екс-голови СБУ, який перебував у розшуку. За його словами, саме завдяки таким генералам в Україні було завербовано велику кількість офіцерів, завезено зброю, що відбувалося роками. Він зазначив, що не дивлячись на постійну роботу співробітників СБУ, мережа диверсійних груп по Україні залишається розгалуженою та дуже небезпечною. Отже, як бачимо, Служба безпеки України продовжує вже свою роботу навіть тоді, коли, в принципі, не завжди воно і видно. Ну, це що стосується того, що відбулося в Україні. Так само цікаві події відбувалися і поза її межами. Так, наприклад, у столиці ФРН сьогодні почалися основні урочистості з нагоди 25-ліття з дня падіння Берлінського муру. Це символ всіми знаний холодної війни. Біля меморіального комплексу «Берлінська стіна» на вулиці Бернауерштраси пройшла пам'ятна церемонія з покладанням квітів. Зокрема, в ній взяла участь і канцлерка Германії Німеччини, перепрошую, Ангела Меркель. Зазначила на наступне «Ми можемо змінити речі на краще», сказала вона. Це повідомлення для України, Іраку та інших місць, де людські права досі під загрозою. Падіння стіни показало нам, що мрії збувається, ніщо не стоїть на місці, додала Меркель. І... Власне, вона знає, про що говорить, тому що сама вона зростала у комуністичній НДР. Ну, а в іспанській Каталонії сьогодні проходив неофіційний так званий референдум про незалежність регіону. Про це повідомляли європейські ЗМІ. Сьогодні, перепрошую, включали ми також Олександру Молоткову з місця подій. В принципі, волевиявлення каталонців, воно таке дуже умовне, тому що юридичних підстав визнавати результати цього опитування, в принципі, і немає. 
дуже уважно стежили за цим волевиявленням журналісти з Російської Федерації, там тільки з Рія новин було, четверо журналістів. На виборчих дільницях, що відкрилися в школах та меріях каталонських міст, учасникам опитування роздавали бюлетні з запитаннями, чи хочете ви, щоб Каталонія стала державою, і якщо так, то чи хочете ви, щоб Каталонія стала незалежною державою. Нагадаємо, що уряд Іспанії вважає цей референдум незаконним. Прокуратура Каталонії за наказом Мін'юсту Іспанії вже розпочала слідчі дії, мета яких встановити, чи міститься склад злочину в голосуванні. Ну, також додамо, що сьогодні голосував, наприклад, Пеп Гвардіола, колишній головний тренер Барселони, а зараз він, здається, тренує Баварію. А може і не тренує. Треба перевірити, в усякому разі. Так, далі. Євросоюз може посилити санкції проти Російської Федерації. Про це в своєму твіттері заявив глава МЗС Литви Ліна Слінкявичу. Зараз ми покажемо цей допис. Він написав наступне. ОБСЄ підтверджує, що російські танки беруть участь у бойових діях на Донбасі. Ось вам і довіра до Росії і прагнення до діалогу. Санкції ЄС мають бути посилені, заявив Ліна Слінкявичу. Так, оце таке було повідомлення. Також американський сенатор Джон Маккейн сьогодні заявив, ну, власне, прокоментував повідомлення про пересування російських військ і важкої техніки вглиб території України. Джон Маккейн зазначив, що якщо ця інформація правдива, то можна вважати, що перемир'я, перемир'я на сході України померло. Саме так, сказав Джон Маккейн. Разом з тим він наголосив, що Сполучені Штати і Європа повинні припинити, давайте вже, мабуть, та, повинні припинити вважати, що надання летальної військової допомоги Україні буде провокувати президента Путіна до подальшої агресії. Найбільш провокаційним для Путіна, за словами сенатора, є небажання США та Європейського Союзу зробити ці Кроки. Ну і так само вже, якщо говорити про позиції Європейського Союзу та до підготовки до якихось бойових дій, в Естонії почалися штабні навчання сил швидкого реагування НАТО. Trident Juncture називається ці е, військові навчання, як повідомляється на сайті Головного штабу Сил оборони країни, згідно із сценарієм, в Естонію вторгається армія вороже налаштованої держави. Ну, в принципі, цілком ймовірно, що мова йде, ну, зрозуміло про яку країну йде мова і е, якою є легенда цих навчань. Ну, в цілому ж за минулі 8 місяців виникало 40 небезпечних позаштатних ситуацій між Північно-Атлантичним Альянсом та Російською Федерацією. Власне, чому і проходять е, військові навчання, зокрема, в країнах е, Прибалтійського регіону. Е, всі ці позаштатні ситуації могли призвести до загибелі людей або до військових зіткнень. Про це сьогодні писав Держпігель з посиланням на дані дослідження британського товариства European Leadership Network. Так, пасажирський літак скандинавської авіакомпанії лед не, зіштовх... не зіштовхнувся із розвідувальним літаком Військово-повітряних сил Російської Федерації, що не повідомив свої координати, повідомляє Держпігель. Власне, така, такий сьогодні був інформаційний фон, про такі речі ми говорили, також ми сьогодні про цікавий стартап спілкувалися із творцем Стартап називається Casual. Кому цікаво, можете зайти на їхній сайт Casual. Крапочка, якщо не помиляюся, PM там в кінці. Така доменна зона, та PM. Це органайзер, онлайн-органайзер, штука дуже зручна. Я вже ну, пересвідчився особисто. Ну і так само в гостях у мене був сьогодні бачу Корчилава, представше посольство Грузії в Україні. Дійшли ми до такого висновку, що в принципі Україна зараз повинна створити буферну зону з територіями тимчасово окупованими, навести лад в управлінні країною, сформувати коаліцію і крокувати вже на захід, ну, проводячи певні необхідні на часі реформи. Ну, власне, власне, це в мене все.
До 10-ї години я залишуся в студії, можливо, щось станеться, обов'язково маємо про це розповісти, але якщо ми знову з вами не побачимося, до 10-ї години буду з вами прощатися, а ви ж залишайтеся з нами. Завтра в студії знову працює Настя Станко-Кіра Толстякова та Ірина Гарнець. Ефір обіцяє бути цікавим. Я краєм ока подивився у їхню верстку на завтра. Дійсно, там є ряд дуже цікавих гостей і я вам рекомендую завтра обов'язково дивитися громадське. Ну і, в принципі, залишайтеся з нами, тому що ми працюємо для вас. Я от навіть не знаю, що додати. Хлопці, от нас тут четверо в студії, а п'ятеро залишилося. Є в когось якісь побажання, там, привіти передати нашим глядачам? Немає? Я зрозумів. Отже, дякуємо, що ви з нами. Дивіться громадське. На тому до побачення. Побачимося з вами післязавтра у вівторок. Громадське потребує вашої допомоги. Громадське належить українцям і є некомерційним проєктом. Підтримати громадське можна у терміналах «Айбокс».Скажи, будь ласка, де знаходиться Франція? Тут. А де Бразилія? Тут. А де Україна? Тут.
На сонце полдень, на сонце полдень. По бескрайнему мордору на рассвет Сквозь стекло замерзшее Он похож на закат Кажется, дотянешься и вот же он Да никак, помнишь, как в маленьком своем мирке Без пустыней вместе ехали, ехали, ехали Столько дней вдруг очнулись, проснулись, поняли Мы одни в этом чертовом вагоне Где все они, кроме нас, все повыпрыгивали Из дверей поезда, который разгоняется Быстрее, быстрее, разбивая время и пространство На куски мы летим без Мазов по краешку пропасти Милая, родная, только ты не уставай Держись, пока на ту тонкому мы Переходим жизнь, ты не оступись Слышишь? Не смотри вниз Я же здесь, я же здесь Я с тобой завис, я же здесь Я же здесь, я с тобой завис Я же здесь, я же здесь Я с тобой завис, я же здесь Я же здесь, я с тобой завис Я же здесь, я же здесь Я с тобой завис, я же здесь Я же здесь, я с тобой завис Я же здесь, я же здесь Я с тобой Завис, я же здесь, я же здесь, я с тобой завис, с тобой завис, с тобой завис, с тобой с тобой завис, 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 с тобой Чекаємо, що ми 
тобою кожен ранок добрий, і я співатиму тобі. І знову ти щаслива поря. Залиш хоча б шанс.